Welcome to our first um, seminar of the year of the Center for Global Ethics and Politics. We're delighted to, um, to see you all. And I'm really pleased and honored to be able to introduce Diana Myers, whom I've known for decades. In various contexts, we were members together of um, Amintafil, the American section of the International Society of Philosophy of Law and Social Philosophy, which I think you were president before me. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition, uh, she is, um, her position, as you probably noted, is Professor Emerita of Philosophy at the University of Connecticut in Stores. And she's held the Ignacio Ella Curia Chair of Social Ethics at Loyola University Chicago, as well as the Laurie Chair in Women's and Gender Studies at Rutgers University. Her most recent monograph, is Gender in the Mirror, Cultural Imagery and Women's Agency, which was published in, by Oxford. And uh, we're passing around her uh, most recent edited collection called Poverty, Agency, and Human Rights, which has just come out from Oxford University Press. She's also at work on a monograph entitled, to be entitled, Victim Stories and the Advancement of Human Rights. So I'm really delighted uh, that, uh, to have Diana here to start off our year. You've also been an attender sometimes at our sessions, and which has been always uh, known for great comments and questions, difficult questions. So this time, hopefully, the audience will present you with a few uh, when you're done. And the title of, of Diana's talk is Victims of Trafficking, Reproductive Rights, and Asylum. Please join me in welcoming Diana. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for coming on this beautiful autumn day. Um, I'll just launch right in. Um, my aim here is to extend and complement a number of arguments that others have already made for the claim that women who are citizens of economically disadvantaged states and who have been trafficked into sex work in economically advantaged states should be considered candidates for asylum. These arguments cite the sexual violence and forced labor that trafficked women are subjected to, along with their well-founded fear of persecution if they're re repatriated. What hasn't been considered is that reproductive rights are also at stake. I'll very, very briefly explain how reproductive rights are implicated in sex trafficking. Then I'll argue that sex traffickers' abuse of women's reproductive rights is persecutory, and that this persecutory abuse obliges destination states to offer asylum to transnational sex trafficking victims. OK, now very, very quickly. Um, well-codified uh, human rights apropos of reproduction. Some of them are listed on your handout. The key thing to notice about these rights is that they include rights to reproductive health and rights to reproductive self-determination. Um, no surprise, sex trafficker, traffickers trample on all these rights. And uh, the reproductive health outcomes uh, for women who spend time in sex trafficking situations are uh, dire. So now getting right to the asylum issue. Women trafficked into sex work as candidates for asylum. The purpose of recognizing refugees and granting asylum to them is to protect people from persecution the 1951 Geneva Convention relating to the status of refu refugees defines a refugee as a person who, quote, owing to well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion, is outside the country of his nationality or her nationality, and is unable or, un or owing to such fear, is unwilling to avail himself, herself, of the protection of that country. The convention never defines persecution, 
but it is clear that refugees are fleeing a credible and wrongful threat of severe harm in their homeland, a threat that targets them because of their adverse positioning in a stratified social system or their opposition to the state. Moreover, were they to return to their homeland, they would in all likelihood be subjected to renewed persecution. Now from one angle, women trafficked into sex work seem like prime candidates for refugee status and asylum. Widely cited legal scholar James Hathaway defines persecution as, and I quote him, a sustained or systemic violation of basic human rights demonstrative of a failure of state protection. By definition, sex trafficking organizations violate their victims' rights to liberty and reproductive self-determination. Moreover, the abusive conditions in which trafficked women are compelled to perform sexual services and the scarcity of medical services provided to them put their reproductive health and thus their right to found a family in jeopardy. These sustained violations of basic human rights notwithstanding, there are major obstacles to classifying trafficked sex workers as refugees. Call the first obstacle to asylum the smuggled woman problem. A growing social scientific literature reveals that most adult women trafficked into sex work are also economic migrants. That is, they have knowingly availed themselves of trafficking networks in order to be smuggled into more prosperous nations in the hope of economic betterment but when they reach their destinations, they are forced into prostitution. In other words, they are trafficked at their destinations, but not in the transport process. In many host countries, however, their cooperation with transnational criminal gangs in the procurement and transport process earns them the label smuggled, an epithet that excludes them from the category trafficked. In the US, for example, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, very ironic title you'll find, mandates procedures for handling alleged trafficking cases and for providing benefits to individuals certified as trafficking victims. Under the TVPA, Qualifying for benefits comparable to those provided to refugees is contingent on being certified as severely trafficked in the language of the law. But to obtain certification, a female foreign national working in the U.S. sex industry is for all practical purposes required to prove that she was kidnapped by, sold to, or deceived by a trafficker at her point of origin. If certified as a victim of severe trafficking, the applicant may apply for a T visa, which can but does not automatically lead to permanent residence. Although application numbers and rates for appro of approval for T visas have increased markedly since the inception of the program, Government statistics do not differentiate between applications from women trafficked into sex work and individuals trafficked into other types of labor. Moreover, the number of T visas granted is tiny compared to estimates of the number of women trafficked for sex work in the U.S. Um, U.S. government estimates run from 14,000 1,500 to 17,500 women trafficked for sex work in the U.S. The number of T visas granted is minuscule. Disappointing as these numbers are, they are unsurprising for, as we have seen, few of the women doing forced sex work are brought to their destinations through force or fraud. Absent certification as a severely trafficked person, Trafficked sex workers apprehended by law enforcement officers are relegated to the status of undocumented migrants and processed for deportation despite having been forced 
to perform commercial sexual services in the United States. Consent at any stage of a woman's journey into forced sex work nullifies her claim to be severely trafficked under US law. Call the second obstacle the Crime Stopper problem. The 2000 UN Protocol to Prevent, Suppress, and Punish Trafficking in Persons, especially Women and Children, supplementing the United Nations Convention Against Trans Transnational Organized Crime. I'll call it the Palermo Protocol, as most people do after that mouthful. The Palermo Pro Protocol views trafficking in persons first and foremost as a matter of punishing transnational criminals as opposed to a matter of rectifying the wrongs inflicted on victims. International law obliges states to pass anti-trafficking legislation independent of refugee law. And the annual US Trafficking in Persons Report and the favorable treatment accorded countries that score well on prosecuting traffickers reinforce this orientation. One result is that women who claim to have been trafficked into sex work are funneled into the criminal law apparatus. In the US, they must agree to cooperate with prosecutors pursuing cases against traffickers and into a special system of, of accreditation for extended residents that does not conform to the established criteria for gaining asylum. In fact, it sets higher standards than the um, asylum courts. By splitting anti-trafficking law away from human rights law and segregating sex trafficking victims from refugees, the legal system closes off the human rights remedy par excellence, namely asylum. Call the third obstacle the social group problem. To qualify for refugee status, the Geneva Convention states, you must be persecuted, quote, for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. Although persecution on account of gender is, is a recognized basis for refugee status, the category women is too broad to characterize the individuals persecuted by sex traffickers. If the diverse women trafficked into sex work are to gain access to the refugee system, the group to which they belong must be demarcated narrowly enough to exclude women who are not targeted by traffickers and must also be demarcated independently of being targeted by the traffickers in order to avoid circularity. Under US law and in line with the UN High Commissioner on Rights, its guidelines, a cognizable social group is one whose members, quote, share a common immutable characteristic, i.e. a characteristic that is, uh, that, that, excuse me, either is beyond the power of the individual members of the group to change or is so fundamental to their identities or consciences that it ought not to be required to change. Call the last and least of the obstacles the government role problem. The Geneva Convention on Refugees requires a refugee to be, quote, unable or unwilling to avail herself of the protection of the state she has fled. So paradigmatic cases of persecution are situations in which the state or an agent of the state inflicts or threatens to inflict harm rising to the level of persecution. But transnational trafficking gangs are not government institutions or agents appointed to act on behalf of government institutions. Consequently, it is not obvious that they can count as persecutors, and if they don't count as persecutors, the women whose rights they violate aren't eligible for asylum. Fortunately, recent advances in refugee law 
render this problem more tractable than the others I've mentioned. In the US, for example, the persecutor can be, quote, persons or an organization that the government was unable or unwilling to control, close quote. Thus a showing that a transnational trafficking organization operates with impunity or with the complicity of corrupt government officials in a trafficked woman's home country suffices to establish the requisite government role in persecution. Okay, so those are the obstacles. Now I turn to some precedents for asylum for women trafficked into sex work. As I've pointed out, there is an international convention governing the treatment of refugees. For better or worse, implementation of the convention is left to each signatory state. As a result, there's considerable variation in the refugee legislation and judicial history of different states' parties. In the interests of parsimony, and because I know most about it, um, but with the caveat that uniformity is not to be found in this evolving and state-relative area of law, I'll focus on U.S. refugee law while noting what I take to be more equitable policies elsewhere in the world. Excuse me. In 1996, the U.S. enacted legislation that directly addresses one aspect of the re reproductive rights of migrants. Section 601 of the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act makes a special allowance for certain victims of reproductive rights abuse. I'm going to quote from the act now. A person who has been forced to abort a pregnancy or to undergo involuntary sterilization or who has been persecuted for failure or refusal to undergo such a procedure or for other resistance to a coercive population control program shall be deemed to have been persecuted on account of political opinion. Okay. And a person who has a well-founded fear that he or she will be forced to undergo such a procedure or subject to persecution for such a failure, refusal or resistance shall be deemed to have a well-founded fear of persecution again on account of political opinion. It's the end of the quotation from the law. Section 601 grants preferential treatment to those victims of reproductive rights abuse whose reproductive rights have been violated in the context of a coerci coercive population control policy. This is obviously aimed at China. In singling out this subset of victims, the law discounts the primary reason for ensuring access to the right to asylum in cases of persecutory reproductive rights abuse, to wit, coerced abortion and sterilization violate the right to bodily integrity that underwrites the right not to be tortured or subjected to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. This is a thought that I'd like to convey to uh, Russell Pierce of Arizona. I don't know if you saw the small piece in the Times just the other day. Uh, he went on the radio, he's an Arizona legislator, went on the radio to say that if he were in charge of Medicaid, there'd be tubal ligations right and left, Norplant would be imposed automatically on recipients, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, uh, unfortunately, okay, unfortunately, the law is written, Section 601, is written in a way that makes acknowledgement of the right to reproductive self-determination contingent on people's presumed reasons for exercising it, namely resisting population control. And of course, that's not the main reason that people resist uh, this coercive 
population control problem. Second, the groundbreaking second precedent. The groundbreaking U.S. Board of Immigration Appeals decision in in re Fauzia Kasinga considers the application of a 19-year-old woman from Togo whose father had protected her from female genital mutilation, but whose relatives demanded that she undergo the procedure after her father passed away. She applied for asylum upon reaching the U.S., and the BIA Board of Immigration Appeals granted her request on the following grounds, and I quote from their decision. FGM is extremely painful and at least tempor temporarily incapacitating. It permanently disfigures the female genitalia. FGM exposes the girl or woman to the risk of serious, potentially life-threatening complications. These include, among others, bleeding, infection, urine retention, stress, shock, psychological trauma, and damage to the urethra and anus. It can result in permanent loss of genital sensation and can adversely affect sexual and erotic functions." Close quote. Legal scholar, and I'm not sure of the pronunciation of her name, Benefer Devar, sums up the ruling as, quote, an unprecedented recognition and protection of a woman's right to bodily and sexual integrity. She then proceeds to argue that Kasinga sets the stage for a full appreciation in U.S. refugee law of the significance of the wrong of sexual violence and its link to violations of reproductive rights, as well as the right to bodily and sexual integrity. Although Devar, um, or Devar, however it's pronounced, places violations of reproductive rights under the umbrella of sexual violence, she doesn't make the connection between sex trafficking and violations of reproductive rights. I'll make a case for that connection momentarily. Finally, I want to mention a, a Canadian asylum case that directly concerns sex trafficking. This decision grants asylum to a Ukrainian woman who had been trafficked into sex work and cites her membership in the following particular social group as the basis for her persecution. I quote, impoverished young women from the former Soviet Union recruited for exploitation in the international sex trade. In my view, this formulation is a breakthrough because it incorporates the gender, age cohort, and economic status of the victim, as well as the social and economic upheaval in the victim's homeland into the set of characteristics that define the individuals whom transnational trafficking organizations single out for persecution. Summing up, there is plenty of precedent for overcoming the government role problem in asylum cases stemming from sex trafficking. As well, this Canadian case makes a start at overcoming the social group problem for sex trafficking victims seeking asylum. But whereas reproductive rights factor into decisions to grant asylum to individuals seeking to escape from state-sponsored forced abortion or sterilization, or seeking to escape from customary female genital, genital mutilation, reproductive rights have yet to become central to understandings of persecution in relation to sex trafficking. I believe that the smuggled woman problem and the crime stopper problem help to suppress reproductive rights issues in refugee law with respect to sex trafficking victims. And I now argue that they can be overcome. So, section four, consolidating the reproductive rights argument for asylum. A law enforcement gestalt frames the smuggled woman and crime stopper problems. And both problems privilege sovereign governance over individual human rights. The Crime Stopper problem fastens attention on incarcerating perpetrators and sidelines victims, except in their instrumental role as sources of evidence against traffickers. The smuggled woman problem compounds this marginalization of victims 
In all but a few cases, it denies victimhood in the name of policing borders and exerting state control over the comp composition of the populace. Once victims of sex trafficking have been tr classified as malefactors along with traffickers, law enforcement becomes the preeminent objective. In practice, the law enforcement gestalt creates a presumption against refugee status for women trafficked into sex work. U.S. law not only directs women who claim to be sex trafficking victims into the T-Visa system, but also sets more stringent evidential standards for obtaining a T-Visa than it does for obtaining asylum through regular refugee proceedings. And that's hard enough, I assure you. However, this presumption, excuse me, however, this presumption conflicts with U.S. obligations as a state party to the Palermo Protocol. Article 14 of the Palermo Protocol states, nothing, I quote, nothing in this protocol shall affect the rights, obligations, and responsibilities of states and individuals under international law including international humanitarian law and international human rights law. And in particular, where applicable, the 1951 convention and the 1967 protocol relating to the status of refugees and the principle of non refoulement as contained therein. Raising an all but insuperable barrier to asylum for victims of one type of human rights abuse plainly abrogates the obligations of states' parties to the Refugee Convention and violates the rights of victims under the Convention. Moreover, the U.S. requirement that a trafficked woman be a victim of force or fraud in both the transport process and at her destination is incompatible with the Palermo Protocol. Uh, some, there's a quotation on the back of your handout from the Palermo Protocol substantiates this point. Um, coercion in the recruitment and transport process is not a necessary condition for trafficking. I do not doubt the legitimacy of putting legal pressure on the activities of transnational sex trafficking organizations. However, deporting women who have been forced into sex work at their destinations does not deter sex traffickers with side businesses in human smuggling. Moreover, implementing the Palermo Protocol requires that a human rights gestalt counterbalance the law enforcement gestalt. In particular, the human rights abuse, sorry, in particular, the human rights abuse systematically inflicted on women trafficked into sex work must be redressed. In addition to bringing U.S. law into alignment with U.S. commitments under the international refugee and anti-trafficking law, I urge that two glaring inconsistencies regarding reproductive rights in U.S. immigration law be eliminated. It is arbitrary to confine the remedy of asylum to persons whose human right to reproductive self-determination has been violated pursuant to the government, man to government mandated population control problem policies. Forced contraception and forced abortion are no less abhorrent when imposed by sex traffickers than they are when imposed by public officials. Indeed, the former may be more deplorable than the latter, for population control, when not an excuse for eugenic population pruning, can be a legitimate state interest. The same cannot be said of the profit motive of gangs of outlaws run amok. As, as it is acknowledged, the traffickers plying their trade in countries with apathetic or complicit governments can be persecutors. The difference between the agents of persecution in the two cases is of no moral significance or legal significance, as a matter of fact. 
If not, the protections of Section 601 of the U.S. Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act should be extended to women trafficked into sex work. For traffickers usurp their right to reproductive self-determination as surely as any government does. The only reliable form of medical care that women trafficked into sex work uh, get access to is abortions, uh, often not performed under safe conditions. Sex trafficking is also inimical to the right to reproductive health. Although Matter of Kasinga does not cite this right as a reason to grant asylum, the decision does cite the adverse effects of female genital mutilation on sexual function and by implication on fertility. Indeed, one of the experts on FGM whom they do cite talks at great length about the effects of FGM on fertility in her work. Uh, the similarities between the detriments to reproductive health caused by female genital mutilation and those caused by forced sex work are striking. Inasmuch as the BIA has ruled that possessing intact genitals is so fundamental to a woman's identity that she should not be compelled to submit to having these organs altered, Surely an intact capacity to conceive and give birth to a child is also so fundamental to a woman's identity that she should not be compelled to submit to treatment likely to irreparably damage it. It follows that being trafficked into sex work constitutes persecution comparable to being subjected to female genital mutilation. Finally, in many instances, repatriating women who have been trafficked into sex work deprives them of the right to found a family. Sorry. Um, so valorized is the virginity of brides and so stigmatized is sex work that many sex trafficking survivors are cruelly ostracized, ostracized when they are returned to their communities of origin. Moreover, once a woman has been trafficked into sex work, her traffickers regard her as property. Although she may have originally colluded with traffickers in order to migrate, she can expect to be tracked down and re-trafficked if she is deported to her home state. Unable to find work or make a marriage, and pursued by transnational trafficking gangs, women trafficked into sex work are highly vulnerable to re-trafficking. Thus, repatriation often, often amounts to refoulement, return to persecution, and non-refoulement is a cardinal principle of international refugee law. All the elements are now in place to justify making asylum available to migrant women forced into sex work. I have argued that the harms resulting from forced sex work rise to the level of persecution. It is indisputable that violations of reproductive human rights can be persecutory. I have identified the persecutory agent. The persecutors are transnational criminal gangs that operate with little or no interference from legal authorities in countries where women are recruited and in destination countries. There's a wonderful paper, by the way, in that anthology that's going on by um, Leslie and John Francis making the case that not only is uh, enforcement of trafficking, anti-trafficking law, very lax in uh, uh, points at home countries. It's also very, very lax uh, in destination countries like our own, despite a lot of publicity that surrounds an occasional uh, prosecution. I've specified the, the features of the particular social group that is targeted by these transnational gangs. They are poor, young females in states where women are routinely discriminated against in education and employment. 
and or where law and order have broken down because of social upheaval, widespread poverty, or recent armed conflict. Add to all of this the likelihood of refoulement if women trafficked into sex work are not granted a safe haven in destination states, and the justification is complete. But I do want to say a bit more about the ethical obligations of destination states. Am I doing okay in terms of time? Yeah. Okay. Um, for the U.S. and states with similar trafficking and immigration po policies, the overarching obligation that flows from my line of argument is obviously to modify the laws and practices governing the treatment of women trafficked into sex work in order to secure the right to asylum. Denying this right or constructing elevated requirements for accessing it is inconsistent with the Refugee Convention and the Palermo Protocol. We are, of course, signatory to both. The obligation to reform trafficking and immigration policy in this way is all the more stringent because destination states provide vast markets for commercial sex sexual services, thereby fostering the high profitability of trafficking. But the ethical obligations of destination states do not end with legislative reform. For immigration procedures are organized in ways that allow implicit bias to unfairly shape outcomes and, the, and these unreliable procedures must be reformed as well. Issues concerning stereotyping and bias recur throughout the literature on sex work and migration. Preliminary to suggesting ways in which to counteract implicit bias in immigration hearings, I'll comment on three strands of prejudice that distort perception of women trafficked into sex work. Martha Nussbaum's work on disgust is a good place to start, getting a purchase on, the one, on one relative, relevant type of implicit bias. Nussbaum sums up her understanding of disgust in the following passage, which I'll quote. Because disgust embodies a, shr a shrinking from contamination that is associated with the human desire to be non-animal, it is more likely to be hooked up with various forms of shady social practice in which the discomfort people feel over the fact of having an animal body is projected outward on vulnerable people and groups. Nussbaum goes on to point out that semen is among the types of bodily discharge that are regarded as disgusting and that this dis disgust transfers to persons who have frequent contact with it, such as sex workers. Along similar lines, Dina Haynes comments that one mechanism through which the, vict through which the victims of sex trafficking are othered hinges on the sexualization of racial and ethnic stereotypes. Since only a disreputable type of person becomes a sex worker, so this argument goes, character assassination follows on the heels of victimization. Another strand of implicit bias concerns poor women of reproductive age. The same attitudes that sparked the gutting of benefits for women with dependent children in the U.S. infect perceptions of women trafficked into sex work. Trafficked women are presumed to be uneducated and unqualified for jobs in today's economy and an unknown percentage of them fall into trafficking schemes because they are trying to migrate in order to send remittances home to their children. Thus their immigration cases trigger the stereotype of the lazy, lying, irresponsible, poor young woman. Inasmuch as the statutory grounds for excluding claimants from the U.S. include, <coughs> excuse me, claimants, people seeking asylum, um, for excluding them from the U.S. include the likelihood of becoming a public charge, this implicit bias can sabotage a trafficked woman's otherwise worthy application for asylum. A third pair of stereotypes interferes with seeing, interferes with seeing women trafficked into sex work as refugees and hence as candidates for asylum. 
On the one hand, we have an image of persecuted individuals as brave opponents of tyranny. I mean, p think of uh, people who get the Nobel Peace Prize in absentia for challenging um, the human rights record of China, things of that sort. Okay. On the other hand, we have an image of, a tra of trafficking victims as helpless, passive pawns of ruthless thugs. Insofar as the latter image, the help helpless pawn Im image, frames perception of an applicant for asylum, its irreconcilability with the image of a proper candidate for asylum undermines her case. Indeed, because qualifying as a severe trafficking victim under US law requires proving that no voluntary action of your own <coughs> contributed to your plight, the law demands that trafficking victims present themselves as conforming to the helpless passive stereotype, which in turn undermines their plausibility as asylum seekers. This pileup of perception problems gives, gives rise to grave epistemic injustice with dire material consequences for many <coughs> asylum seekers. In asylum hearings, the credibility of the applicant is crucial, but the stereotypes I have sketched, if allowed to prevail, raise doubts about her truthfulness in virtue of her presumptive character as a member of the very sort of group that is apt to be persecuted through sex trafficking. But as Lawrence Kiermeyer, he's a, an ethnographer of uh, asylum proceedings, um, as Lawrence Kiermeyer points out, if the asylum seeker attempts to address probable biases in her sworn <clears throat> testimony, quoting from him, any trace of this effort will cast doubt on her account, close quote. In contrast, Fatma Marouf focuses on ways to improve the institutional setting in which U.S. immigration proceedings are conducted rather than on ways asylum seekers or their attorneys, if they're lucky enough to have one, can overcome the implicit biases of judges. In my view, Maru's remedies for the problem of implicit bias hold most promise. She exposes a number of institutional arrangements that conduce to the influence of implicit bias in immigration hearings. Um, one, immigration judges prior work history in the Department of Homeland Security where immigrants are viewed with suspicion. Okay, So the very people who are supposed to be impartially judging asylum cases have previously been working in Homeland Security and they're not well equipped to play the role of impersonal, impartial judges of asylum cases. Second, judges have incredibly overloaded calendars and insufficient support staff to do legal research. The practice, and third, the practice of delivering oral decisions right on the spot, okay? Not written decisions, carefully thought out, just here's my decision for you. To counteract the implicit biases and ensure greater impartiality, Maruf recommends separ separating the appointment of immigration judges from the Department of Justice, reducing judges' caseloads, eliminating the rushed schedules they are expected to maintain, and educating judges about the distinctive issues that persecution on account of gender raises. Okay, one last paragraph? Sure. Okay, because um, this is important. I want to address the so-called floodgates argument, all right? Um, floodgates arguments, okay, if we don't stop them, if we don't deport them, you know, we'll be overwhelmed. Floodgates arguments rest on demographic considerations, for they claim that a certain type of persecution is so pervasive that the receiving nation must protect itself from a potentially overwhelming influx of migrants. By itself, this demographic concern is plainly insufficient to justify excluding a particular type of asylum seeker. 
To be ethically convincing, a floodgates argument must invoke a normative claim that the alleged persecution is so trifling or tractable that the state is justified in barring these victims. There are other ways to solve this problem. Dina Haynes questions the cogency of the demographic worry, for there is no reason to believe that more women would be induced to attempt migration than is presently the case. Nor is there reason to believe that women would willingly endure the brutality of forced sex work in order to qualify as refugees in destination states. I have argued that the normative claim is a travesty. On the contrary, acknowledging asylum claims stemming from abuse of trafficked women's reproductive rights is vital both because of the gravity of the reproductive harm inflicted and because equitable application of legal principles demands it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I want to ask um, uh, some questions for clarification. So um, one of the questions is the connection to the right to marry that you're saying is violated. Um, and I'm not sure if there were other reasons that you connected it to the right to marry. The one I remember from your paper is that um, she won't be able to marry if she goes back to her home country because she's lost her virginity. Mm -hmm. And that will um, sully her in the eyes of possible suitors. Right. But that's... I don't know if that is your only reason, because in some countries where women are trafficked from, there isn't such a high priority on virginity, especially from East European countries, or at least some of them. Uh, it's not like coming from the Middle East. I mean, there are different norms. Um, it's not that it's wonderful to have been trafficked, but the idea of not being a virgin Mm -hmm. doesn't have that same status. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you, I missed it, and you have other reasons to say um, that um, the right to marry is, is being violated. And the other question, or I have a lot of questions. Well, it's being put very much in jeopardy. Uh, I mean, okay, but go, go yeah, ahead. And the other question is exactly where is it geographically that the woman's rights are being violated because the intention to do to traffic her is in the home country, mm -hmm. but the actual implementation of it is in the host country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where is it that you want to say that her rights are being violated, um, and does that matter for your argument? Uh, that's really interesting. Um, let me take the second question first. Um, I don't think it matters for uh, the argument. Um, she's, as long as she's forced into sex work in the destination country, her reproductive rights are being violated here, okay? In the, in the destination country. In the destination country. Okay, so that she cooperated with traffickers hoping to get here and prove, improve her circumstances, I think does not really make any difference. Okay, um, let me ask you, here's what I'm thinking as I'm trying to sort out your question and make sure I, I'm not missing something because it, it's really interesting. Um, is, the, is what background of your questioning this, that if uh, there are criminal acts taking place here on our home soil, then the that's not a basis for asylum. That's simply a basis for better criminal enforcement. 
Right. Okay. Yeah. But that's really interesting. I haven't th I haven't thought through the, this question, um, but I th I think the argument has to be that there's a continuum a continuum of crime running from the home country to this place. We know that the the persecutors, okay, are transnational gangs, okay. Um, some members of which may be American citizens, true enough, okay. But then do we view them under the rubric international gang, or do we view them under the rubric criminal element in the U.S.? Thank you. I need to think more about that. Okay. But um, I need to make, sh make sure I'm on solid ground. Um, I, I can tell you one thing. Uh, someone, the Canadian, I think it's Canadian, or is, uh, there's a, uh, I forget whether it's a Canadian case or a UK case, um, where a woman was trafficked from the Ukraine into sex work in Hungary, okay, and was de deported back to the Ukraine, and she fled to Britain, okay, so the sex, forced sex work was not taking place in Britain, it was taking place, it took place in Hungary, and she fled from the Ukraine to Britain, and she was granted asylum okay. um, on the grounds that she was a victim of trafficking. Um, but that's a very, I mean, the, the question you raise, ra raises really interesting legal questions, and I'm not sure I can answer them adequately here. As, as far as Eastern Europe is concerned, okay, um, your information is, and virginity, and my information is different, okay. Um, one of the big problems that organizations working in Eastern Europe um, have in uh, taking women who have left trafficking situations, providing them with health services, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, treatment, et cetera, et cetera, is that their future, okay, is in very grave doubt for a series of reasons. One, they can't, they're in a very bad position to go the marriage and family route. Two, uh, problems about equal opportunity, in work in those areas, lack of work generally in those areas, and then extreme vulnerability to re trafficking. So the the argument does not hinge on the right to found a family issue in connection with uh, uh, the re resumption of persecution. But, I mean, there may just be very different kinds of information. But I, I would like to talk to you about this stuff. Yeah. But now we have some more questions. Yeah. Uh, Josh. Oh, so I'm just wondering, so, I mean, I think I, I thought it was great. Um, my question is, in, in some ways it seems like the trend is to move towards more sort of global forms of enforcement sort of transnational solutions, transnational problems. This seems like transnational problems. I mean, so I'm wondering what you think about the idea not just of, you know, sort of fixing US law to, to make it cohere with some of the things you've been saying, but I mean, the, should we get the ICC involved in this? Should we create a transnational organization that is going to sort of police and also help victims of sex trafficking? Do you think that's sort of justified by the same? I mean, it would seem, one of the things that I was thinking the whole time was just like these jurisdictional problems 
crazy hard mm -hmm. to solve. And a transnational organization that could cover the idea that, you know, destination country, origin country, and asylum, I mean, the best place for, for, for many of these women may be neither of those two countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, there right. may, may be some third country. Right. And that, you know, if we had international resources to sort of mm -hmm. facilitate those sorts of moves and maybe mm -hmm. compensate states who are going to take on the burden of, you know, letting people in, things mm -hmm. like that, that, you, you know, that seems like maybe a more robust solution than, mm -hmm. than what you're suggesting? It's also more yeah. radical. I, I just, yeah. yeah, that's interesting, but here, it, it would take more than uh, putting the question of trafficking into the hands of the ICC. Um, because the ICC uh, does not concern itself with the human rights of victims, and it concerns itself with prosecuting crimes against humanity, etc. Um, so we'd have to have yet another international umbrella organization um, to deal with issues about providing refuge, safe havens for women who had been trafficked. Traffic. And I think that politically, the uh, chances of sovereign nation states giving up control over who gets to migrate and who doesn't get to migrate into them is vanishingly small. <laughs> so um, that's one reason to, to focus more on making the case that destination states or states that can provide safe havens should be doing it. Right. Um, in the beginning part of this paper and in your argument, one of the problems is that taking this particular problem of sex trafficking and trying to accommodate it by the laws of asylum and refugees. Mm -hmm. So basically it's an attempt to take one type of behavior and use a second or already established codification of the behavior to encompass it. Mm -hmm. And there's problems with the definitions. Mm -hmm. But then you cite positively this Canadian uh, mm -hmm. citation mm -hmm. that is more specific to the areas involved. Would you say that you would like to have the law move to a more specific identification of this problem rather than try to fit it into existing legal rubric? Would that be a solution towards this? Is the problem that is trying to shoehorn it into asylum and establish cases that don't really fit? Um, well, my argument is that they actually do fit. Okay. okay. <laughs> And that um, certain certain nation states are are resisting acknowledging the legitimacy of that fit by using these types of arguments that you see. They're legit, like the uh, smuggling women problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are technical arguments against yes. needing to take on this responsibility. Exactly, yes. exactly. So that. Um, there's just no justification other than policing borders for um, the higher standards for accreditation as a trafficking victim than standards for getting recognition as a refugee and then uh, getting the case for uh, an asylum court. And something else you said about this, just you know, to give you a sense of really how fluid refugee law can be when it wants to be. Um, you know, everyone was surprised and delighted when Kasinga was decided on appeal in her favor. Um, just last week, um, an immigration court set a precedent for uh, granting asylum to women victims of domestic abuse in nacho societies with 
cultures of family violence and governments that refuse to enforce women's rights. So we have a whole new category of refugees, okay? Creating a fiat, you know, but, but that's just the way refugee law works. And um, it will be interesting to see how that develops. And I'm just pushing for another category of refugees. Uh, along those lines, a student uh, emailed me a question. Well, okay. How are you? An email question by somebody who had an email. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It's sort of along the same lines, so, but I don't, I'm not sure I got it entirely clear. The question is that, um, that the usually sex trafficking is illegal in the countries of origin, and so and they're victims of non-state actors, so that they wouldn't have a well-founded fear of repatriation given the standard ways of understanding political asylum and law. Uh, yeah, you were addressing that sort yeah. of. I think the student is under uh, a, a misimpression there. Okay. Um, you, you wanted to hear your argument. Make sure you speak to the oh, okay. so that might have a tendency to speak to action. <laughs> 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 <Sorry. laughs> um, okay, I, I, I think uh, it's under a misimpression. Um, what the. Um, in the U.S., at any rate, the um, persecute, persecuting agent need not be a state actor or agent of the state. And this has been explicitly litigated in U.S. asylum courts and upheld. It can simply be um, operatives of some sort in another country who that whom that country is unwilling or unable to control. So the argument is that in so many of the uh, origin countries, um, the uh, Politicians are corrupt, they're easily bribed by trafficking gangs, they pretty much do whatever they want. And so, as a result, within US law, um, they would, you know, they would be recognized as persecutory agents um, in virtue of the lack of control exerted on them. Um, in the home yeah, countries. But just in my own, uh, speaking for myself now, it, um, I think it sounds great, uh, and especially appealing to a, a human rights violation, but that isn't the standard modus operandi in the United States, at least, is to recognize even basic rights as human rights. So mm -hmm. I just think that it would require, it's, it's a good direction to go in, but it requires a degree of um, transformation of consciousness and the categories that we operate as well. Yeah, yeah. And Europe is much more uh, in tune with the recognition of these rights as human rights. That's true. Uh, as is Canada, yeah. actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, way behind the, uh, the movement. We're behind the movement, way behind. Well, we are, and Carol's right about this. We don't have. Um, how should I put it? A culture of human rights here. We have a culture of constitutional rights. Um, Certainly not things like we heard of. Right. Exactly. Just torture. Right. <laughs> right. 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 So um, yes, you know, there's no question that to <clears throat> make this line of argument politically viable in this country. Uh, in a human rights framework is um, a, challenge. a challenge. But I think it's one we have to yeah, take on. Yeah. In other respects as well. Yeah. So
So let me ask if there are other comments and questions. Carol. Yeah, this is sort of on the same topic. I was wondering how much work for reproductive rights specifically really needs to do. In, in some regard, you, you focus a lot on the capacity to procreate and sort of the fundamental reproductive right. Mm -hmm. um, and what about women who are already infertile, for example, mm -hmm. going into the trafficking? Okay. Do they have a lot of... <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the traffickers could really take advantage of this group. I mean, yeah. it's, it's horrible. I'm not I've done this at all. <laughs> Um, but to, how much work do, do, do you need reproductive rights to do, or is the threat of not safe passage home, or the threat of re-trafficking enough to, to get um, the legislation passed? Yeah, I have focused on reproductive rights here because that's a piece of this puzzle that nobody else has taken on. Okay. So other kinds of issues about, you know, the kinds of brutality women are subjected to, uh, things of that nature, that's all been discussed uh, in the literature. I'm just trying to add a piece to that puzzle. And infertility, uh, well, is not the only problem. Uh, the, the sexually transmitted diseases that um, are pervasive uh, among women who have been trafficked, uh, pelvic infections, all kinds of really serious health consequences. Uh, not to mention post-traumatic stress disorder, and so on and so forth. So there are much broader health issues here than just fertility. Um, but uh, there's fertility as well. It's a uh, I've read that uh, many, or some international legal scholars have been trying to uh, get trafficking to be understood or categorized as torture and therefore uh, get into the human rights system and asylum system. I just wanted to ask you if you, if you say any like, uh, problems with that or, or if you. I mean, it sounds like a very plausible argument to me, okay? But uh, it would just be another good argument uh, for recognizing the rights of tra women trafficked into sex work. So you, your um, approach is not kind of any opposition to that, or you know, it is your approach. opposition. No, 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 no. I'm, I, I, it's certainly not my argument that there are no other good reasons for granting asylum. My argument is just, look, there is another one, <laughs> and it supposedly matters to us because, you know, we're very eager to give Chinese people, and by the way, Chinese men have benefited more than Chinese women from Section 601 of our immigration law because um, they're forced to get vasectomies or they fear being forced to get vasectomies. We're all for reproductive rights when we're not too you know, friendly disposed to those who are violating them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just another piece of it. Are Thank you.